Good morning. I'm Adele Field Fote. I'm the Director of Spinal Cord Injury Research at the Shepherd Center, and I have faculty appointments at Emory University and Georgia Institute of Technology. It's my pleasure to have been asked to give the grantee perspective of the role of NIH and NCMRR in a rehabilitation scientist's career. So, of course, the role of rehabilitation and the role of rehabilitation professionals is to help individuals with disability to overcome barriers. However, rehabilitation professionals themselves, those who start out as clinicians, may face barriers in their paths to becoming scientists. So this is me as a brand new physical therapist. And uh, please don't judge my outfit. It was a Halloween costume, so that's why I'm dressed as a kindergartner. But in my professional career, I was not trained to undertake the types of research that are necessary for moving rehabilitation research forward. But there are many things about clinical training and that one learns in our professional training program that are valuable as a foundation for career and rehabilitation research. Clinical rehabilitation is person-centered, it is interdisciplinary, and it's really rooted in teamwork, which are all very, very valuable for uh, rehabilitation research. NIH has really recognized the value of rehabilitation and the need for helping the development of rehabilitation research scientists. And this is very clear in the NIH research plan on rehabilitation from 2016, which we're in the process of updating. Many of those who are in the audience um, will know Ralph Nitkin from his very long and productive work in the training portfolio of NCMRR. And as testament to the value of um, that NIH places on rehabilitation research, the rehabilitation research plan actually in its 30 pages has 22 mentions of training. So it's clear that this is a high priority for NIH and NCMRR. In my own research career, I got my start with an institutional T32 training grant for which Dr. Shirley Saruman was the PI for the doctoral training program in movement science. And um, as a small indicator of when this was, you can see Dr. Saruman here at a uh, American Physical Therapy Association meeting during that time. And you can see from the poster, you can get a sense of when this was, how many years ago. At that time, I was very fortunate to work with Dr. Paul Stein, professor of biology, who is a world-renowned expert in central pattern-generated control of movement. And I worked with a preclinical model of spinal cord injury, a complete spinal cord transection, and my work focused on understanding the role of spinal circuits in the production of bilateral coordinated behavior um, when there was no input from the brain. And during this time, what I learned from this work and from the prior work that Dr. Stein had done is that the spinal circuits are tremendously intelligent and control this coordinated behaviors even when the behaviors are produced bilaterally. However, what came out of that was a concern that there might not be a lot of interest in a PhD trained physical therapist who knew a whole lot about turtle scratching behaviors. My uh, other PhD student colleagues were being asked to give talks and I was not being asked to give a talk. And so uh, I had a little bit of concern about the path that I had chosen, even though I thought there was was tremendously exciting work. But right about that time, it became very clear that there were human evidence for the value of central pattern generated behaviors, in particularly as relates to stepping, and that these principles did generalize across species. There was also very good evidence that rehabilitation is among the most valuable approaches for some types of disability. This is one of the newer studies that I think supports that premise. This is from a systematic review that was published in 2016, where the authors looked at all the different types of cellular, molecular, genetic, technologic, pharmacologic interventions that 
are directed at improving function in people with spinal cord injury. And the conclusion was that the highest level for value of these interventions was for those that combined the intervention with a rehabilitation component. And so as a brand new PhD uh, looking for an opportunity to do postdoctoral work, I felt very fortunate to be able to identify Dr. Blair Kalansi, who was a, a neurophysiologist at the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, who himself had published some very elegant evidence that the human central pattern generators are expressed um, in individuals with spinal cord injury. And this seemed to be an excellent opportunity to be able to apply what I had learned as part of my PhD training to the clinical world in individuals with spinal cord injury. And so during this time, I was fortunate to be able to obtain a K01 award with the mentorship of Dr. Kalansi, where I studied the role of sensory motor inputs on walking function in people with spinal cord injury. And specifically, I looked at uh, the role of circuits that are associated with reflex um, activation of the lower extremities and saw how these could be incorporated as part of a locomotor training program for people with spinal cord injury. And so from this work, what I learned was that neuromodulatory inputs that are targeting spinal circuits can really train as a valuable adjunct to locomotor training. But like all research, it often raises questions beyond those that it intends to answer. And so the question that this work raised was, does this approach really optimize walking related outcomes in people with spinal cord injury? Or might there be other approaches that are um, more valuable for improving walking function? So this work led to my first R01 award where I evaluated different locomotor training approaches to improve walking function in people with spinal cord injury. And this slide really brings home the point of um, what an important partner we have in the individuals who participate in our studies. So these individuals give up their time to volunteer for our studies and beyond the data that we're able to acquire with their time and contribution, they also give us very valuable insights about what things are important to them. So in my laboratory, we're very interested in underlying mechanisms. So we spend a lot of time during electro, doing electrophysiologic studies of um, cortical responses and spinal reflex modulation. But really, when you ask individuals with spinal cord injury, they don't really care if their motor evoked potentials change or if there's better neuromodulation of their reflex circuits. They really want to know whether this approach is going to improve their walking function, improve their hand function, reduce their spasticity. And so I think those are very valuable perspectives to keep in mind when we're doing rehabilitation research. So this study, which was intended to compare different ways of improving walking function after spinal cord injury, indicated that there seems to be neuroplasticity associated with spinal circuits that are involved with walking um, when we train individuals after spinal cord injury. Um, and it raised other questions about what other circuits we might be able to modulate with our training and our modulation approaches. Specifically, in people with spinal cord injury, even though the damage is not to the supraspinal circuits and the damage is at the spinal level, there's very good evidence that there are maladaptive changes that occur in these supraspinal circuits in cortical organization, for example, after spinal cord injury. So might the neuromodulation approaches that we have accessible to us as rehabilitation clinicians might those modulation approaches um, change cortical circuits in a way that improves hand function in people with spinal cord injury. So that question led to my second R01 award, which really focused on using peripheral nerve somatosensory input as a way of changing cortical activation and cortical excitability to increase volitional drive to the hands and improve hand function in people after spinal cord injury. So based on this work related to 
cortical plasticity and our prior work related to spinal um, reflex plasticity, it, it's very clear that neuromodulation can be a powerful adjunct to training. But some of the questions that still remain relate to whether the doses of these neuromodulatory inputs are optimal and whether the training doses are optimal. For example, in pharmaceutical studies, there's a tremendous amount of time and resources that are spent on working out dose response relationships, but we have yet to do that when it comes to rehabilitation um, interventions, despite the fact that in many cases, rehabilitation is among the most valuable approaches that we have available to us for improving function in people with disability. And so since that time, we have focused our studies on um, dose response relationships and different types of clinically accessible neuromodulation technologies that are intended to improve movement, to decrease impairment, and to better understand how we can integrate the use of these technologies into real world clinical practice. As important as it has been to address these research questions, it's also valuable to keep in mind that these um, this funding support has provided opportunities for training research, future research professionals. So I've been very blessed to have some outstanding trainees in my lab, both at the PhD level and at the postdoctoral level, who've gone on to make important and valuable contributions of their own to our field. So beyond these investigator-initiated uh, funding awards, NCMR has also been very proactive about supporting tremendously valuable initiatives to promote growth and progress in rehabilitation research. Among the ones that are most near and dear to my heart is training in grantsmanship for rehabilitation research. And this is a program supported by NCMRR that we offer in collaboration with the research, rehabilitation research community. So we have mentors who contribute their time, and we work for in this year-long program in a one-on-one -on -one mentorship fashion to provide grant proposal mentorship, to allow opportunities for peer review and participating as a peer reviewer, and to have um, pre-submission to have proposals reviewed by peers and by mentors as well. And so I'm very fortunate to be able to work with Dr. Rick Siegel on this TIGER initiative along with Daniel Korkos and Deb Reimer, who are such valuable members of our executive committee. In addition to TIGER, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Medical Rehabilitation Resource Network. This is an amazing um, initiative that provides support for rehabilitation research in many, many different areas. And I encourage you to go on the NIH website and learn about these resources that are available to support rehabilitation research. So with that, I'd like to conclude with one of my favorite sayings from Joseph Campbell, follow your bliss and the universe will open doors for you where there are only walls. So a career as a rehabilitation professional is a very wonderful springboard for a career as a rehabilitation scientist. And there are many opportunities available for you at NIH and specifically at NCMRR. I encourage you to look at what opportunities might be most valuable for promoting your career as a rehabilitation researcher.